Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and I want to give you a special welcome. If this is your very first time, you're part of a movement. We kicked off the show just a little over a year ago. We've got almost 200,000 downloads and listens, and we're excited you're here. If this is your first time to the show, we talk about all things related to real estate investing from single family houses to commercial to self storage to land to assisted living, to anything you can think about. But our primary focus most of the time is single family houses. How do you find the deals? How do you find the hot motivated sellers? How do you get them funded? How can you sell them quickly? How can you control them? And how can you have the freedom in this business, which is why we get in this business to start with? Well, if you've been tuning in over the past few months or year, you know I have had some amazing guests here on the show. And today's show, it's absolutely no different. But before I introduce my special guest today, I've got a free gift for everybody. And that is an online demand class that is gonna show you how to get the funding for your deals, regardless of your credit, your experience, what your mortgage a banker would say, or any of that. So you can go check it out at www.jayconner.com dot com forward slash money podcast. That's www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. Well, I'm so excited to have my friend and colleague on the show today. His name is Chris Prefontaine and Chris is quite the guy. He is the best selling author of more than one book. In 2017, uh, he released The Real Estate on Your Terms. And now just this year, he has released a new book titled The New Rules of Real Estate Investing. So let me tell you, Chris was so kind to send me an autographed copy of his, his newest book that he's released. And you for sure are gonna wanna get a copy of that book as well. But before I bring on Chris, just a little bit more about him. He's been investing as of today's show for over 27 years. He's also the founder of Smart Real Estate Coach, and he's also the host of a very large famous podcast himself, which is titled the Smart Real Estate Coach Podcast. Now he lives in not Newport, North Carolina, like I do, but he's in Newport, Rhode Island with his, uh, his wife, Kim, and their family, and they run the family business. So anyway, he's just a very, very well-known, successful, for many years, real estate investor himself. He's known to be an expert on terms, and I'm so excited to have Chris on today. And one of the reasons that I decided to have Chris on my show is because he's just like me. The, the foundation of his business is having a servant's heart and giving back to the community, which I'll let him talk about that in a moment as well. So with that, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me, my friend. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Chris, you've been in real estate investing for quite a while and you, you do the business a little bit different than some other folks. I know you focus on terms and that, but before we get into your expertise on how you control properties with how having to risk your own money, how did you get involved in real estate investing? Well, at the risk of dating myself, which I think you already alluded to the dates. So I had been around a family company. I'm going way back to like 90s, or late 80s, early 90s. But the family company wasn't real estate, Jay. They actually, my, my dad would build his own buildings in the welding supply industrial gas business and then lease them back to himself. You know, so he would create a little income stream there. And then he started flipping land. So I was around that for a while. I built homes from like 91 till... 95, bought a realty executives franchise. So I had my broker hat on in those days. And then I sold that to Cobalt Banker in 2000 and then started working on my own investments ever since and coaching people around North America. But then the lovely debacle of 08 happened and that caused us to totally re-engineer what we're doing. And, and thankfully, in hindsight, that's what we do today. And that is not using banks and not signing personally on loans and all that fun stuff that you alluded to. So I had a huge blessing in disguise in 2009 when I was totally cut off from the banks. I was relying on banks to fund my deals. And when I look back as to how that changed my business and I knew I had to do business a different way, would you say your 2008, 2009 was in some kind of way 
a blessing in disguise as well as to how you can now look back and see what happened? As painful as that was, yes, 100%. And there's no question. I, I mean, I always say things happen for a reason, but it's often difficult when you're going through it, right? So it took me, I would say, all of four years to wind out of all the junk and actually launch in 2012, 2013-ish the way it lives today. Of course, it's been refined, but the way we live and breathe today, which is entirely different. And even though we were at that for many years before the crash, I, I was not exposed to, to the things that we're doing today. Well, that triggers an important question on my part, and that is something happened. We had the crash in 2008, 2009. And so what way were you doing the business and what way are you doing the business now differently? Sure. We were using banks 100%. And of course, when the market was screaming up, we made the ultimate mistake of thinking it was an ATM machine and would never stop. So when things took a hit, it was, they were knocking on my door. I had the great credit. I had the personal signatures. I thought that was okay. And that's what we're supposed to use it for. And so now we buy everything, lease purchase or owner financing. We don't use banks. We don't even raise private. We don't use any down payment money, minimal if any. And I probably would, I will tell you that with maybe one exception in my personal home, but other than that, we don't do it. We control not counting student deals. We control around 50 or 60 properties at any one time. And none of those are we on personally, am I on personally? And I can sleep a lot better than I could in 08. I can tell you that. <laughs> I got you. So what does it mean to buy and sell or control a property on terms? Uh, primarily for us, that means lease purchase and we exit with the rent to own or on a financing and we exit with the rent to own. However, with the owner financing for us, Jay, because I know there's different niches, as you know, in, inside of that niche, we look for free and clear properties. And when we do that, we look for principal only payments monthly. So those are some lucrative deals. As long as we can get out there like four and five years in terms, we've got some nice six figure deals there. Oh, my lands. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you, if you can negotiate, not if, but when you negotiate as the real estate investor with the seller of the house and you're making principal only payments, I mean, my land, you're not only creating positive cash flow right now, but you're building wealth for the long term when that property pays off. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I like them just after going through what we went through. And of course, with everyone asking now, well, what about the recession? Uh, all we're doing now is pushing out longer and longer terms with people that are able to wait. That's all. And, and you know, I, I know from my show and other shows, people say, well, come on, what seller would do that or why would they do that? You know, our office building, Jay, we bought recently, a year ago, almost today, that everybody on this island, I live on an island, said, well, you can't do that on the island. You're not going to get terms. Well, this guy did 20-year terms on our office building. You know, no banks and to the point where he doesn't want to be paid off. That was an estate planning issue. So I, I love doing the terms. You just have to find them. That's all. Fish in the right ponds. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of times I'll hear particularly new real estate investors either say, or I know they're thinking that, well, I can't make that kind of an offer because they'll never accept that. And you know what I've found over the years? You never know what the seller is going to accept until you make the offer. Yeah, it's crazy. You and I talked about a mutual acquaintance just before the show. And just a conversation or two with him caused me to go back to about eight of our deals, eight out of 50, right? Like the first week and renegotiate terms. And you know what, Jay, with one exception, they all said, oh, yeah, you know what? That's a good idea. We extended it some like, 15 years, 10 years by, by adding a teeny bit of interest, a teeny bit after years of principal. And they all said, sure. So I'm just blown away by if you ask what, what can happen. Exactly. You never know what they'll do. You know, one thing I, I know you hear from your students, Chris, uh, just like I hear from mine, when it's particularly a new real estate investor, there's so many different strategies that new real estate investors can learn and uh, begin to implement. But I know you talk about there's two specific strategies that you have in mind for a new real estate investor to focus on. What are those two strategies? To be honest, if they're brand new, I don't even like the owner financing route for them because when we do owner financing, we don't put money down, which means we have to pay a transfer tax usually on their behalf. So I love for a newbie, I love the lease purchase because the lease purchase, we have a whopping $10 deposit built into our agreements. And they're not taking title. In my opinion, for lack of a better word, it's a lot safer 
And I just know from talking with a lot of our students, they can sleep better at night knowing that they're not taking title and there's not this big unknown for them. I love the lease purchase. And the lease purchase can be done, as you know, with a debt-free house. If you're afraid of transfer tax, you don't have to take title. It can be done with an over-leveraged house. It can be done with just your average, hey, I've got 30 or 40 grand equity in the house. So we've, we've done all those types of deals, lease purchase. So, you know, regardless of the exit strategy that we may prefer, whether you got, a, you know, somebody's wholesaling deals or they're controlling on terms, buying subject to, buy and hold, assisted living, it doesn't matter. All of us are looking for properties to buy in a way that makes sense. And, you know, marketing changes. I mean, you know, you've been in the business a long time and, you know, what worked a few years ago, you know, I hear, I hear people talking uh, now in a high-end mastermind group that I'm in about how in some areas direct mail has gotten so competitive on locating deals and other areas it hasn't. Some areas are, you know, using Facebook a lot. Other areas are doing outbound calling. Other people are knocking on doors. What's your preferred method in today's market on finding sellers to work with? Yeah, I would agree with everything you said. In 90 or 95, let's say 95% of our deals are coming from the phone. And most of those would be done by virtual assistants, but either them or, the, or ourselves or our students. And it's for rent by owner, which is a big one lately, or for sale by owner or expired listing. Still, those are the three staples. The only difference is, as you know, some markets are hotter than others. You know, I'll use two extremes I have in my student base. DC is hot. So they're not doing as much with FISBOs. They're doing more for rent by owner and expireds. Whereas Pennsylvania, or at least the pocket that we're in, man, I don't think that ever got hot with, with, this, <laughs> with this particular student. So he's He's doing a lot with FISBO still. So it just depends. All we do is change the allocation of those three buckets really back and forth. So when you say phone call, are you talking about outbound calling, like code calling? Yeah. The, uh, so the virtual assistants will call on the for rent by owner ads or the for sale by owner or the expireds that did not sell with realtors. Yeah, that's, that's most of it. And the only reason I, I started like that, you know, going back seven or eight years ago in this niche and that I have the students is fairly inexpensive, even with a VA to handle that, as you know. Absolutely. And so, so on these outbound calls, and you have virtual assistants, I suppose, that you can recommend that make these calls, but is their job to get complete property information sheets or to just find out if the house is for sale and then negotiation takes place by somebody else? Yeah, good question. A little of both. I don't want them to get stumped up with things like the mortgage information. If, if they're going to get stumped up with it, I'd rather get as much info as I can. Quite frankly, you said it earlier or you alluded to it. And that is, I want to know why they're selling. That I can skip all the other data, even if it's all there. If I know why they're selling, I can go solve something. And I don't mean to, for the listeners to know when I say that, I, let me qualify. I don't mean necessarily bad, you know, motivated in a bad way either. As I said, a lot of ours are free and clear. So what's their motivation? They want all the money and they can wait. So that's cool. Or, you know, it's just, I'm on the market, my house, I want X. I don't owe anything. I just want to make sure I get that price. So when I say motivation, I just, I just want to know the reason they're selling. It's like the same reason you or I would go to an attorney or, or an auto body or a dentist. We got, we got to solve something. It's not always bad. We just got to solve it. Yeah. Are you having success in today's market with you and your students buying or renting lists to do outbound calls? Or are most of the calls made at for sale by owner sites and Craigslist and where the people are already trying to sell their house? Most of them are on sites where those three things live. However, when someone has some cash flow going, I don't mind recommending, and we do, to do some very light, predictable mailing, be it a postcard or a yellow letter to a free and clear. I just love free and clear and I love absentee, but everybody's a little different in their, in their niches. Yeah. I like a combination of absentee and free and clear. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. love it. Depending on what that list shows. I, I absolutely love it. Right. Right. One question I was going to ask uh, was triggered by this thought. And, you know, I said in my introduction up front, the reason I wanted to, one reason I wanted to have you here on the show, besides you having a unique way of doing the business is your core values. You know, you, you come from the space of, I know you like to give back. In fact, you're welcome to give out those 
spaces and communities that you give back to. But for you to do that, you got to have a servant's heart. So with that in mind, how important do you believe it is for someone to really be successful in this real estate investing space based on their core values? Do they need, in your opinion, do they need to know really what their core values are or what we even mean by core values? I, I mean, I have a bias towards it from a company standpoint and from a moral and ethical standpoint and third, from an energy standpoint, not to sound too woo-woo about that. Some people don't understand the whole energy thing. I just think when you, when you base it on the values, all your decisions, I'm talking about hiring, firing, taking a deal, taking on a buyer, everything should be based on those values. There's, then there's no discussion really amongst the team. Like, does it fit with what we said our values are? Great. And then from the giving back standpoint, we happen to focus on a foundation that literally saved my son's life after a head injury years ago. And he was in a coma and wasn't supposed to walk, talk or eat again. And, and so we are traveling there in two weeks as a company to give all the children gifts that we, I just love it. And I think it's great energy we just happen to focus on that as one of our main foundations. I got it. I got it. Well, speaking of having a servant's heart, you've got a free online class that will give people some great value and uh, tell folks about the, the name of this class, the name of this webinar, and I will actually give out the website to take people there. That sounds great. Thanks, Jay, for, for bringing that up. So it's a uh, real estate on your terms and it's how to create $75,000 profit deals by creating three paydays every single deal. And I'm just big on free. If they can come sit through 50 minutes of dealing with me and my accent, then <laughs> they, can, they can decide, hey, this is a niche I want to get more involved in or not. I'm not so naive to think we're the only niche and same as you. Like everyone's successful in their niche. Find someone and something and that'll give you 50 minutes to decide if that's a cool fit for you. That's all. Excellent. Well, we've put a special uh, website URL together for this free training that you've got, Chris, and we're going to put it in the show notes. So everybody go to www.jayconner.com forward slash smart real estate. That's all one word. So www.jayconner.com forward slash smart real estate. Chris, as I can't believe we're up on the time, but what's the best advice that comes to mind today for a new real estate investor wanting to get started? Yeah, because I ended on that comment about the niches, let me say this then for anyone new, and this could be outside of real estate too. Find a niche, or in this case, we know what industry, but find a niche that you think you can relate to passionately. Yeah, you want to help someone, whatever it might be that drives you. And then in that niche, find someone that's currently where you want to be, like currently doing it. They didn't do it 30 years ago. Like they're doing it. Like Jay and I are in the trenches every day. And then here's the hard part. Easier said than done. Put the blinders on. Don't look left or right. And here's the even harder part. Do that for 36 months. 36 months. This is not a get rich overnight. This is a project that can create huge wealth. So if you do those three things, I promise you, you'll have a phenomenal experience. It's the third one that gets tough for people to set their expectations right and go the long haul. Yeah, well, staying with it and being persistent reminds me of a recent mantra that I find myself saying because I've learned it from experience. And that is, if you are not in anything, if you're not consistent, you're not existent. You've got to be consistent. So anyway, Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for offering the free training. Again, everybody, that's www.jayconner.com forward slash smart real estate coach. Chris, thank you so much. And by the way, Thanks, buddy. Uh, some people may want to uh, tune into your podcast. Tell folks how they can find your podcast. I just go over to smartrealestatecoachpodcast.com. We feature all niches, not just ours. And we want you to be exposed to everyone. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Chris. And thanks to all of our audience for tuning in. Whether you're watching on iTunes, uh, be sure to subscribe, rate and review. If you're on one of our YouTube channels, be sure and subscribe. Don't want you to miss out any of the fantastic content that we have here on the show. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. And here's to taking you to your next level. Bye for now.